I'm here representing Create AR. Uh, we are a Microsoft Mixed Reality partner. Uh, we were founded in 2016. We're a San Francisco-based startup. And today I'm going to discuss uh, hands-free user experience design in augmented reality. Specifically, uh, we do most of our work in HMD devices. Uh, before I begin, uh, quick question, show of hands, have you ever had trouble using uh, user experience or user interface in augmented reality? Okay, most of you, and one more time. Um, have you ever seen anyone else have trouble using an augmented reality <laughs> interface? Okay, good. Um, this is actually an industry-wide problem, and it is um, hampering adoption. So we've got some solutions in mind. Wrong button. All right, so let's talk about the design process that goes into user experience. Um, before I jump into it, I'm going to say that Everything we've done is built upon the great minds that came before us. Uh, Tom Chi is a great example. Uh, he's got a, a great presentation I've linked at the last slide talking about rapid prototyping. Um, in the first day of the Google X project that built Google Glass, him and his team had prototyped the basics of Google Glass using nothing but a coat hanger and a thin slice of plastic. And it allowed them to verify some assumptions and save them months of dev time. Um, so how do you actually do that? Well, you start by clearly defining your goals. You have to know uh, what you're looking for in order to know uh, if you're on target as you're doing your testing. Uh, next, you need to check your assumptions. So uh, when you're coming into it, especially in a new space like augmented reality, it's really important to take nothing for granted and assume that everything you know might be wrong uh, and that every idea needs testing. Uh, and when you go to test new ideas, it's also very important that uh, you try the simplest possible idea first. It's really easy to get lost in details and polish and bells and whistles, but try to pick the most simplest version of your idea to test. Um, and finally, when you have an idea that's not working, it's also really easy to get too attached to it and not want to move on. Um, but it's also very important to kill that idea quick and try the next thing. Uh, so let's talk about some assumptions that a lot of people make when they're designing UX interfaces for augmented reality. Um, first is that Hollywood gets it right. The movies like Iron Man or Minority Report, um, they look awesome, they look flashy, and it's intuitive that what they've shown us is a good example of what the future of augmented reality interfaces are going to be like. Um, another assumption is that gestures are ideal. Uh, we're manual creatures. We've got five fingers and an opposable thumb. We're used to controlling things with our hands. So it makes intuitive sense that we would control our augmented reality interface with our hands. Um, and finally, that field of view is a really key factor in augmented reality. And a lot of the devices have limited field of view. A lot of people would go so far as to say that a limited field of view is one of the greatest barriers of adoption right now for augmented reality. So when we set out to test these assumptions, we took blind users uh, not affiliated with the project, and we had a basic hypothesis that users should be able to navigate an interface without a tutorial. Um, this, you've heard in a lot of talks uh, this conference about um, how far mobile phone devices have come the last 10 years from or clunky interfaces to begin with to this experience where you can jump in without a tutorial and actually uh, feel like an expert. We want to try to replicate that same thing in augmented reality. So when we started to verify our assumptions, we found some interesting things. First off, that looking cool is not at all the same thing as being effective. So when we look at movies like Iron Man, uh, Tony Stark, we're always seeing him from the third perspective. And uh, we're never seeing the user interface from the first person perspective. So when you actually get into an augmented reality device, um, the goals of an, an interface are very different than the goals of a movie maker when they're trying to entertain an audience. Very different third person versus first person perspective. So a lot of the assumptions that go into what make it look good are not the same thing as making it feel good or feel intuitive. Um, another thing is that every hand is unique. And the problem of gesture recognition, I would argue, is actually as complex or more complex than the problem of speech recognition. So at least in speech recognition, um, you're working towards a known language, English, Spanish, Japanese, or whatever language you're working with. Um, when it comes to gestures, what you're effectively asking users to do is to learn a new form of sign language, uh, one they've never used before. And uh, after having given thousands of HoloLens demos, I can anecdotally say that no two uh, air taps are the same, and people usually stumble over this. Um, finally, uh, uh, mice are actually overloaded as input devices. So we, eventually, we, we initially invented the mouse as a mechanism to tell a computer what we were trying to look at or interact with. Uh, we didn't have any other mechanism uh, when, when the first mouse was invented. Then over time, we added more functionality to it, including persistent m manipulation and even hotkeying. Um, now, in augmented reality, we have different mechanisms to 
uh, identify what someone's looking at. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, and lastly, uh, people get lost in 360 degrees of content. So we've interacted with content our entire lives uh, inside the confines of a box. And that actually gives us some really useful anchor points as content creators, essentially you know, four walls and four corners, uh, and, and users can expect content to be in that little area. As soon as you remove that as a constraint, uh, users tend to get lost in, in very easy and simple ways that have nothing to do with user interface. It could be that uh, one of their friends interrupted them while talking because AR can be a social experience. It could be because they get distracted by a flashy light, which actually happens quite a bit with Fortune 500 executives, actually. Um, so what is the ideal interface then um, based on those findings? Well, one, you know, novices should be able to navigate the, the experience without a tutorial. So we already got one over that. But how do we do that? Um, we can take uh, some learnings from related uh, industries like video games. So when the shooters, uh, which were initially built for PCs, moved to the consoles, a lot of players had trouble using the joysticks. So some game developers had the great idea to add in a concept called aim assist, whereby instead of needing to target something directly, you kind of target near it, and the system would figure out what you were trying to target at and give you some guides. Um, finally, uh, next, you, you have guardrails where if someone does get lost, the system has some sort of soft way to get them back on track. Um, and then another really important thing about the user interface that a lot of augmented reality interfaces are missing is the sense that experts actually feel like experts. So after you've used it for a little bit, you, uh, you can actually fly through it, almost like it was a fifth limb or an extension of your own consciousness. Um, and in order to do that, there needs to be a sense of skill. Users need to be able to get better at it as they uh, progress through it. So um, a good example with like a radial activator, for example, that's something you look at and it fills up over time. Uh, an initial implementation might be something like, wait a second, and then that counts as a click. Problem with that is that your novice users will be like, oh no, that's too fast, I didn't mean to click that. And your expert users will be like, oh, that's too slow, I, I want to click through way more stuff than that in a second. Um, so how do you address that? Well, uh, you could consider doing something like variable time for the <laughs> amount of real activation and use some other metrics to decide how long it should take to activate. For example, um, a simple one is, are you looking right at the center of that object or kind of on the outside? If you're looking at kind of the outside, maybe it takes a little bit longer because you're a new user and you're not as uh, agile with the interface. And if you're an expert, you look right at the middle, bam, that's an immediate click through. Um, and as you're giving these extra metrics to users uh, in order to steer their user experience, it's really important to provide feedback mechanisms. That's how your users learn. And that's how they develop the skills, hopefully without a tutorial. So audio, visual cues are very important. All right, so I just got the time warning, so I'm gonna jump through really fast. Intentional user experience is what we've arrived at now where the users primarily use gaze for steering. You can build user experience primitives um, in order to get across the majority of uh, operations the users are gonna go through, which actually frees your hands. It's very useful for uh, manipulating physical objects and training, and also very useful for precision manipulation. Um, so uh, I'm, I'll, I can talk about some of these afterwards if anyone has any questions. But I do have a quick video I'd like to talk about. Um, Psy is our little AI guy that provides emotional support and that little guardrail if someone's looking at the wrong thing for too long. Uh, we have an experience that I can share with you afterwards where you can see this live. And here is the video.
respect to the other presenters, I'm gonna wrap this up a little bit early. Um, so my name is Ray, and this is Create AR. We are a Microsoft Mixed Reality partner. We are part of the first Global Hollands marketing campaigns, and we're actually raising a seed round in the next couple months, so if you're interested, please come to me for more questions. And I've, as I mentioned, I've linked the Tom Chi experience in that video in this presentation. So thank you if you have any questions, but let me know.